switches. Please give us a very special welcome to the fabulous duo that created Mother Tongue, David J. Peterson and Jesse Sands. Thank you for taking time to chat with us today. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, we're excited. Good. Yeah. We are due. So Good. your yeah, job well, is... Uh... Oh, go, go, go. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Uh, two things. One, I was realizing we, we should probably, you know, open the document, right? Oh, the actual language document. So if they have questions, yeah. do you want me to grab my laptop and have the language document open? So that Ooh, way, that would be even better. Then it won't like, okay, yeah, yeah. We're going to do that. Ooh. Um, fancy. Yeah, this is cool. so fancy. So, so that, that was one. But the other thing though, is that, uh, I mean, what people listening won't know is that, uh, we, we really want to apologize. We were supposed to have done this uh, interview quite a while ago. Um, but uh, <laughs> first, we, we had a surprise trip to uh, Hungary, which we were not expecting. Um, and then we just completely forgot about it while we were there on the day of. That would have been when we were in Vienna. Yeah? No, no. no. It was actually our travel day. We were in Munich and a layover. And then... Oh, okay. No, but then we, like... rescheduled, we rescheduled it two gosh i i don't know I, we rescheduled it to the day such... that we were we were in vienna and um and i completely uh blew it it was in my email and i at the very least could have said hey we're not going to make it but instead i feel very bad that that you're just waiting for some response uh for me and so i apologize about that Oh, we don't have a way to say sorry. No yeah, worries. There's no, say, there's no way to say sorry yeah. in, in mini shape. It's not yet. You because you don't apologize. <laughs> yeah, oh, no apologies. Never, never. <laughs> that must be it. Hey, <laughs> hey. Exactly. That's, so that's you don't need to apologize. That's as we are. So you're good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Anyway, I, no sorry. worries. Preempt you. No worries. No. Um, so awesome segue, because you guys have a really cool job of like just creating languages, which is incredible. And so like, what made you want to do that as a job? Or is that something you always wanted to do or just, it's so cool. How did that kind of happen? I will say like, I don't think anyone our age yeah. um, and older ever, ever thought that creating languages could ever be a job. Um, so much so that actually, as far as we know, David is the first person who had it as his sole job. Um, that's, you know, living wow. off of being a language creator. We don't think anybody else has done it. And so now I'm the second because I've joined him. Yeah. Uh, and so, no, like that was not even an option to consider. Um, if I had known it, then. Yeah, that would have been a cool childhood dream to have. I was, uh, you know, when I started creating languages and finally met other language creators, which was a few months after I started, um, I was, it was made quite clear that not only was it not possible to, of course, have an everyday job doing this, uh, you would never, ever make money um, because that was the level of respect that was accorded to uh, language creators and created languages at that time. Um, this was shortly before the Lord of the Rings trilogy came out, mm -hmm. and that was really where things started to change. Yeah. Um, because, mm -hmm. like, you know, it, it wasn't like somebody created a language for those movies. They were using the languages that Tolkien had already created. But um, it was really the first production of that scale, and also the first production, I think, of Tolkien's to seriously use his languages on screen with subtitles, you know, in important moments with main characters. Um, and that kind of changed a lot of people's thinking, I think. Um, it was a start to something much bigger. Uh, but, but yeah, in terms of uniqueness, I think probably a unique document is my daughter's long form birth certificate. It's got to be because it asks for your profession. And so I said, all right, I put language creator. This <laughs> was my profession. <laughs> That's, That's awesome. It's probably the first, Is that like yeah. the first time you actually got to wrote that down on an official document. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't think you have to write it on your taxes. Do you like what you do? Gosh, I don't <laughs> know. I was just like, 
Yeah, I mean, <laughs> right? Uh, truth be told, there isn't even sure, like, anything sure. to do with us. IRS is like, um, sounds fake. Like, yeah. <laughs> like on production schedules for, for television shows and movies, they have everybody that's all the crew uh, separated into departments. And I've been in at least five different departments on various productions because there's just no place for us. Um, and I've been told by, what was it, the the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences and the Academy of Motion Pictures that there's just no place for me. Because I try to just join because, you know, like the if you're a member of the Academy, like you get free copies of all these movies. And I'm like, I want that. <laughs> and they said, no, Hell we yeah. don't know what your job is. <laughs> yeah. <gasps> That's so rude. Right. Oh, my guys. <laughs> I, I mean, they were do really, better Academy. Get they with really it. Polite. But, okay. Yeah. Okay. So they were polite about shutting you down. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, still. For fun meetings. That does suck. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Oh, that, I guess that was so, the long way of saying, no, we didn't have dreams of that. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but like you didn't know to, so. Right, right. There you go. Yeah. There you have it. So how long did it take to learn how to create a new language? Oh, that's something that um, it's one of those things that you first have to have a passion for and then you develop a skill over a long, long period of time. Um, because I think all conlangers have a sort of starting point where it's like grand idea, I'm going to create this language and it's going to be amazing. And like, it, it's not. Uh, <laughs> and so it's, it's just one of those things that you have to keep working at. Um, so yeah. it's not even a length of time because, um, you know, I still learn stuff, you know, and, I, and so I still am a developing language creator, even though I've been doing it for um, almost 20 years. And David's been doing it over 20 years. And, and you know, there's still growth to be had. Um, yep. So, yeah. Yeah, um, there's kind of this odd like progression, uh, at least for early conlangers. It was like day one, you come up with the idea to create your own language. You know, day two, you've got like um, a couple pages worth of stuff. Day three, you realize that you're really, really good at this. And then day four, you're like, I should teach other people how to do this. Uh, I think I'm ready. Um, <laughs> And then it's like, especially it's easy without feedback. Um, and so like, you know, it takes a while to learn that, uh, that you don't know as much as you think you do. And then to start the real learning process. I think for me that took about um, s seven or eight months mm -hmm. before I, I really could accept and understand that what I was doing wasn't very good and that I actually had to start, you know, learning how to do this. Um, it took a while. Um, nowadays, the progression, I think, is a little different. It's like starting to um, create a language, and then step two is, I should get paid for this. Huh? Right. <laughs> yeah, it is very, I think, different now. But it's also, um, you know, David and I both have a background in linguistics, which, you know, obviously comes in handy when you're mm -hmm. working with any kind of language right. thing. Uh, and so that that knowledge was already there in terms of just how languages work in general. Um, for people brand new to it who don't have that background, there's that added layer of figuring out that you don't necessarily know as much as you think you know about language, even your own native language that you use every day um, and figuring out like what the structures are and what's possible. And definitely another thing that I think has not changed for beginning conlingers is that every feature you learn about that's cool, you try to shove it into one language, which <laughs> makes it a grand mess. Uh, <laughs> and so I think that's still consistent. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah so it's not necessarily something that you can put a time frame on and be like, in six months, you can be a conlinger too. It's more about, do you have the passion <laughs> to keep doing it? Because like, it's, you got to work at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you got to keep up with your skills too. I progressed in certain ways. I need to get better. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> some things I'm still pretty good at and some things I get better at. Some places I'm just not as good. But that, that's also why it's very good to work 
with somebody if you can work with somebody and if you can feel good about working with that person. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I had a hair that was like tickling my neck this whole time and it started moving and I thought there was like a bug. Oh, on my heck neck no. I was about to no. That's I a. Okay. It's a no We're from going. us too. Like I would. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, no. Okay. No, thank you. <laughs> That sounds like like when you were talking about step one, step two, step, that sounds like a meme, a PowerPoint or something that you can make. <laughs> we need to make that happen. Like as you said it, it was unfolding in my brain. <laughs> nice. <laughs> also, I'm just now realizing, Greed, do you have on a Scylla t-shirt? Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Nice. Yeah, it's by one of our <clears throat> fandom artists. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. Dang, that's good. That is yeah. really good. Yeah, we have some really talented artists in the community. I've known a lot of good artists shared on Twitter, um, just amazing things. And right now it's really um, mm -hmm. not, not art necessarily, but uh, the creativity and the Photoshopping of the picture of the four and then the yeah. like, new TV series that they could be in, like the Real mm -hmm. Housewives of <laughs> Fort Salem. And yeah, like, the yeah, meme, like the, the meme edits and whatnot. Yeah, it's yes. funny. It's, there's a lot of, we like keeping the, keeping the funny going. You have to, because yeah. Motherland can be a very depressing show if you don't. <laughs> that is very true. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> so when you begin your journey to kind of like, when you're tasked with creating a language, like what's kind of like the first thing you do when you're tasked with that? Like, is there like research that you would do or like, where do you start? Like, there's the yes and like no to the research alphabet? part, because like, honestly, you start right by having a lot of deep conversations with um, people involved in usually production mm -hmm. to figure out what exactly they want for the language. Um, and when they give us mm -hmm. materials or like when it's based on a book series or, you know, they say, here's what what, you know, it's coming out of, um, you know, we try to read the book and try to figure out what, uh, you know, what world this is. Um, which is the case for some of the things we work on. Motherland, of course, did not have that, but any script or anything that they sent to us, we, you know, read and tried to understand better, um, you know, who the speakers are going to be. And then from there, it's really a matter of now we need to nail down the sound that you have, because for most people, that's really the heart of what the constructed language is, because they're not, you know, going to learn it, they're not going to know it. And so for them, a really important component is just how does it sound and does it create the feel that you wanted for, you know, your show or movie or whatever. And so, um, and mm -hmm. David's very good at putting together sound files and kind of like options. And, um, and so it goes from there. Yeah. Um, it's, and uh, you, there can be a bit of back and forth with that as well. Uh, if, um, you know, if they if they decided that it didn't exactly fit what their what their expect mm -hmm. what their expectations were, um, I feel like often they either have an idea for what the sound should be or not really. I think that that was I think that was the case for this. Um, mm -hmm. It was just like yeah, really? the, the the marching orders were were vague. Yeah, this one was actually a very, very fast language build in terms of how quickly we normally work. Um, oh God, yeah. Because usually you get, you know, like we're right now working on projects where it's like, okay, in about six months, we're going to need to start filming. So you've got this amount of time to work on it. Um, for Motherland, we <laughs> had 15 days. Yeah. <laughs> Um, what? Holy crap! <laughs> yeah, so it was it was what? like all that work condensed into a two week time frame, and so once they did approve the sound, um, which like David had said, I don't remember there being a, a lot of like I think they liked the vision you had for it, uh, and so I think it wow. um, that part went pretty quickly. Uh, but then the next part was you know like once we do have that sound approval of, yeah, this is what we were looking for and that works, uh, you know, green light, go ahead with the other work. Um, 
it was essentially we had to divide and conquer. Like we couldn't even really work together on a lot of stuff because so much had to get wow. done so quickly. And so like, you know, we made some grammatical decisions and then David was like, all right, I'm going to get this ready. You start doing this. And so we would, you know, mm-hmm. work and then come together. Um, and at the time we weren't living in the same place. And so that was, you know, a lot of Jeez. weird timing with phone calls and time zones and, and everything. But it was, it was yeah. intense to the point where like at the end of it, I, on the one hand, was so, like, immersed in in the language. I felt like I was super familiar with it. But on the other hand, we would, like, look things up in the document and be like, when did we type this? Like, because, you know, it's like you get so in that zone (laughs) that you're, like, forgetting everything in the world. And so, you know, we would see these notes and we're like, we have a word for that? When did we do that? (laughs) (laughs) We're so smart. We thought of this already. Go us. (laughs) That's a nice little pat on the back. Yeah, then, but like to create a brand new language in basically two weeks is insane. So like, it thank is. you guys for accomplishing that. <laughs> yeah, you That's get all crazy. the awards. <laughs> yeah, seriously. It was, a, it was an extremely yeah. uh, unique like time and process because um, originally that would have been something I, I said no to because, uh, you know, I was I was approached directly for this. And um, once I had the time frame and also the like the specs, I was like, this isn't going to work. And uh, that was when it was my agent who suggested this because um, for years I'd been trying to get, uh, you know, work for other conlangers. And I've been somewhat successful um, getting jobs for people here and there. Um, but it was like just the, the sheer amount of work that I had to do and the amount of time I had, I hadn't really done that since, um, star crossed where I had 10 days. Um, and, and I was like, I, you know, if I could get some help with this, it would be a lot easier to tackle. Um, and, and my agent said, well, you know, we can just ask if you can, if you can hire an assistant, because most of the time I can't because all this stuff is, is NDA and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, I never thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, and so that was what I did at first because um, and I, you know, so I thought, OK, I can hire an assistant. And so then I put out a call for an assistant, um, uh, hoping that Jesse would apply Um and uh, and also hoping that like the application she put together was good, which it was. Thank, thank goodness. Um, <laughs> that would have been a bad day if you looked at it and went, "Oh man." Yeah, <laughs> but like, I mean, there were really the the four other people that were finalists that were also really good, and so it would have been fine. But it wouldn't have been it would have been wouldn't have been perfect, uh, which is what we did because you were there. Ah, incredible. But, um, but yeah, so that was the first time I, I got to work with somebody. So it was not only, uh, creating, you know, a new language in in 15 days with nothing uh, to draw from, but it was also, uh, my first time working with Jesse. It was Jesse's first time working on a project. Um, it was my first time working with anybody really. Uh, and we were in two different locations where she was two hours ahead um and also and very different daily life schedules because i was true. at the time a morning person would get up early and work and then go to bed about the time when he was finally oh, yeah. like awake and ready to <laughs> i did my best work between like 10 and 2 um 10 p.m 10 and 2 a.m <laughs> but mm-hmm. yeah also though i i really have to say though like by the end of that first season i felt really really bad that you know that I had hired you as an assistant, I shouldn't have. You should have just been my partner. And then second season, she finally gets a screen credit and they credit her with the other production assistants. <laughs> yeah, they put me no! in the wrong place. No! Oh, really? Yeah. Why? But season, season three, uh, it's fixed. Yeah, season three, they got it. Oh, good <laughs> Lord. Please. Come on. And that took seven episodes in season two before I got on the credits. That's true. I it was like, we are you kidding? We have to deal no. with that every time. We just we just worked on Paper Girls and didn't get credit at all. 
just forgot. I just that finished is... that show. So great. Good job, guys. Oh, oh thank you. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> that was great. Yeah, I bet you were wondering. That's... I wonder who did all this. I, I guess I'll look through the credits. Hmm, there's nobody mm -hmm. there. But that That's is so messed up. I feel like that happens too often. Yeah, it, it does. It does. Um, but Paper Girls was one where it was obviously based on books. And so for the research exactly. component, I read the books. So that way, you had um, that, you know, we could, we could better understand what the world was and, and what they were looking for. So yeah, so that's an example where, you know, that's kind of kind of research we do. Um, I don't know if you can call it research really, because it's so fun. But you know, <laughs> that was a fun language. Yeah, hey. it was. Hey, research doesn't because... have to be boring. <laughs> That's true. That's yep. true. <laughs> it's just yeah. nicer when it's entertaining. Yeah. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so um, do you think it's easier or harder working with multiple people to create a language? Well, that's an it could interesting be like, question. Depend upon the person, but... It really, it really does depend on the person and it depends on the personalities together in terms of work personalities and workflow and things like that, obviously, because I mean, everybody's had school group projects, right? So mm -hmm. everybody knows yep. how difficult it can be to have those kind of intellectual projects where you've got to figure out how to, how to get the dynamics right. Um, and so, yeah, we are very fortunate that we work well together from like the the very first day. Um, and so that was very fortunate. David's actually worked with other people. I've never worked with other people on Conlings other than David. And so I don't have any other experiences, but David does. Yeah. Once, once I, I, it actually wasn't even when I worked with Jesse the first time, once I started working with, uh, uh, with a few other people afterwards, I was like, there's no reason that I need to work with anybody other than Jesse. She's um, really get each other and she's really good. Um, it, it, and it's true. Like she's just extraordinary and, and we work extremely well together. And he likes making me blush. Oh, it's like... <laughs> well, that's, but it's evident from watching the, the YouTube video where you guys were working on uh, the finale of season one. Like you can just oh. the back and forth. It was just very smooth. So that's yeah. It was that was a lot of fun. I'm glad you that recorded was. that. Um, I'm glad I recorded that one because we recorded another one, and I discovered at the end of it that I recorded an hour's worth of silence. You could have uploaded it and said, relaxing, silence. <laughs> I know. So, like, we did that same thing for episode 109, and it was a lot of fun, but nobody will ever hear it. Well, that, that also reminds me, though, that was another unique thing um, about working together was not only being in separate places, but actually during part of the language build process, I was in Missouri um, for a trip where I had no That's internet right. access. So I had to find a public library oh. to go like use their internet to upload stuff. Cause I'd be like, David, I'm working. But like I was in a, I was in a spot where it's so rural that to even take a phone call from him, I had to go stand on one leg and, you know, hold the hand this way. And I had to be out in the yeah. middle of the gravel road. You don't have right to tell me. <laughs> I'm from Arkansas. I know what you're saying. So you know what I'm saying. So that was exactly that process. And then actually the, when we were working on the translations for the, the final episode, I was in Philadelphia visiting my sister. Mm. And so like, Throughout the process, we also had to deal with, you know, travels and I was in shifting locations and <laughs> there was at least internet access in Philadelphia, though. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> that was fun time. So, yeah. <laughs> so with all your work, like creating languages, does that skill translate into like learning new languages? Like, does that facilitate becoming a linguist with languages that exist i wish <laughs> i wish um <laughs> I... good answer <laughs> so yeah i mean like i I've, I've been studying linguistics um since 2000 um yeah t spring of 2000 would have been my first linguistics class and so like i you know been, been doing linguistics for 22 years 
Um, and I think I'm still um, about as good at learning languages as I was in high school. Uh, <laughs> but like, for me, for me, like, I loved taking language classes because I loved the, um, you know, like the first two semesters where you're learning all the structures and you're learning kind of the ins and outs of the language. And then in general, I usually plateaued as a language learner in terms of being able to speak the language. I can understand a lot more. So, yeah. you know, always one of those people, I think most people are, can understand more coming at me than I can actually produce. And then I've got such a crazy, like, filter in my brain that it won't let me talk unless I know what I'm about to say is at least as close to perfect as I can get it. And so, you know, it's like, yeah, I'll understand. <laughs> and then I'll be like, hmm, five minutes later, I finally have my sentence constructed that'll like, you know, fit in the conversation five minutes ago. And so, you know, I just sit there. Um, but like that hasn't changed. That's still my style. I think what does get easier is, um, you know, the more you're exposed to it, the more you can look at language and start seeing patterns that you wouldn't have noticed before. Um, mm -hmm. Just because it's like you, you start knowing that it's even a possibility uh, to have that pattern. And so you can start seeing more, I think. Have you had any experience in terms of, of being a better language learner now? I mean, it's just, it's a lot easier. So like we were, we were just in Hungary. Hungarian doesn't, isn't related to anything that either of us have studied. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's distantly related to Finnish, but it's really hard to even spot the similarities. Mm -hmm. But it's like, you know, we were going through and it's like, we're figuring things out. You know, we're figuring things out. It's like, you know, it's got a, it's a huge case language, but we've dealt with enough cases when creating languages now that it's like, we've figured out a lot of them, I think, you know, and it's just like, oh, that's probably what that is. So we look it up. Oh yeah, it is, you know, there. Um, and then we figure out, oh, that's, that must be used in this fashion and so on. So it's like, you're able to figure things out. That doesn't translate to um, speaking and understanding necessarily. Um, it, it's because uh, when you're speaking a language and using a language, there's a lot less analysis that's going on, like actual like front of the brain analysis. Um, a lot of it is just uh, passive. Um, and so what I've discovered is that um, there. It, being really good at picking up a language and using it has a lot more to do with um, with personality and uh, and confidence uh, and uh, and also a lack of shame, like really, uh, because that's important. There's so much inhibition that happens in your brain when it comes to learning a language because it's okay and cute for kids to make mistakes in language. We expect it. But with adults, you don't expect to make the same kind of mistakes that a child makes, even if it's a language you don't speak. And so as you're you know, struggling trying to figure out to it, you just dare die or das here if you're learning German, it's like, your brain is almost punishing you. It's telling you, it's like, you're an adult, you're supposed to do this well. Uh, you're not a kid, you're not supposed to make mistakes like this. And it's just kind of like all this shame being put on you that just, you can't function as well. Um, you know, so it's like the, the people that I've known who genuinely do not care, not just they say they don't care, but like you can kind of feel them exuding this kind of not just not really just confidence but it's like like oh i made a mistake and i noticed it oh isn't that funny you know it's like what can you expect i'm just learning this for the first time i made a mistake haha maybe i'll learn from it let's roll with it you know somebody that can actually like do that they're a lot better at picking up language um they make a lot of mistakes at the beginning but we all do but like they use that and they don't let it drag them down um and so it's like if you want to give people instructions about how to, you know, learn a language better, it's really hard to tell somebody, well, it's like, feel better about yourself. <laughs> it's like, okay, how do you do that? <laughs> but yeah, that we and here's our five step that, course that, to self-esteem. <laughs> yeah. Right. But yeah, we represent both, of, both sides of that. Cause David is like, yeah. And he'll just speak anything with confidence. And I'm like, Oh, I got to make sure this is right before I say it. And with, with certain languages more than others, like 
I'm, I'm willing to jump in there with German. It's harder to do that with, with Japanese. Um, yeah. You know, not that, I mean, I, I learned some. I was able to do some stuff, but it's like, it was just harder to feel. It, 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 German just feels like a little, a little, like a ball pit to me, you know, like the, like, like, like Dashcon, but good, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> good. I love it. <laughs> well played. Um, uh, so, so how many languages do you guys speak? I would only claim that I speak English. Um, on backup, I speak German. Yeah. Um, but German. you know, from there, it's really. Um, I've studied a lot of languages, but like I said, I like getting that structural knowledge and then. Ooh, what what other language? And so I kind of move on. So um, I mean, I, I've yeah. studied quite a few, uh, but really only English and then German. Yeah, with English and in Spanish, I feel pretty good. Um, and obviously, in German, you enjoy yeah. being in the ball pit. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, it's it's being great. <laughs> um, and those are it's like, I'm going to use that because those are great ways to say it. <laughs> yeah, and it's like below that, um, it's like. Uh, the the converse it's like you know you, you reach little plateaus in the conversation so it's like German is there then then French I've had to use more French than German but um, oh yeah French is there and then like below that it's probably Arabic and Russian um, but Arabic is a little strange because they start out teaching you modern standard Arabic um, which isn't really anybody's first language um, instead of what everybody speaks are these quote unquote dialects, which are actually kind of just separate languages mm -hmm. that are, are really unified by a writing system, um, which uh, kind of like Chinese's writing system, it's, um, the Arabic writing system is less precise than like the Roman alphabet. So you actually can use it to write different sounding variants of, of the language. Um, whereas like with, with the Roman alphabet, it's like, you got to specify every single vowel. So there's no way like you could get by saying like, oh, I'm going to write this and uh, people who speak, you know, French and Spanish and Italian and Portuguese, they'll get it because it's all kind of written the same. It's like, no, nah, they're, they're written pretty different. Whereas with Arabic, most of the vowels, like you just don't write them. Um, and so you can kind of get by like knowing that, okay, this consonant is pronounced this way in this country, but this way in this country. And we have different vowels here, but it doesn't matter because you don't write them. You just recognize the shape of the word and you go with it. So like, um, and you know, Chinese is the same way where Cantonese and Mandarin sound extremely, extraordinarily different, but you use the same characters, which don't really specify sound very much. Uh, and so you can get by with, uh, with writing it that way and have, people who speak it differently be able to read and understand. Um, how did I get there? What are we talking about? Language learning. Oh, yeah. And and then you. And then it's like, you know. Went. Yeah. Sorry. I, and then like, you know, uh, American Sign Language, I'm okay, but I, I, I lack a lot of the, a lot of the glue, you mm -hmm. know. Like these, just like a, like a, like a cache of like 500 vocabulary words that are super common in every conversation, like in in most like you know basic day to day conversations. That's the stuff you really need, uh, in addition to the grammar, in order to get by. Um, and you know, I often don't have that. Anyway. Okay. Yeah. Nice long Fair answer. Enough. For... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, great answer. Honestly. No, no, it was a great answer. Thank you. Because <clears throat> yeah. you just gave me a new way to describe, you know, because I took f four years of Spanish, four years of French. And then mm. I was like, hmm, well, I have to learn Swedish. So we're going to. And then that was a whole thing. So I'm going to say <laughs> I'm going to say that I'm in the ball pit of Swedish from now <laughs> on. Yeah, so thank color. you for that. I remember that. <laughs> we're gonna have to we're gonna have to drill down on some um, Swedish, by the way. Swedish and Danish and Icelandic. Mm. We're, we're going in a couple weeks. <laughs> a couple weeks, Ooh, we'll learn it. We'll nice. learn everything we need. Good deal. We got it. Uh, how big are your suitcases? Because I I'm sure I can fit in one of them. 
<laughs> How comfortable are you being in a tight ball for 12 Listen, hours? I don't care as long as I get to go. <laughs> um, all right. So is there a language, either conlang or natural, that you don't particularly like? Or do you feel like each language is kind of like a piece of art? Oh, every single one is magnificent except for Dutch. Dude. I'm sorry. That, that was the joke. That was the joke my Arabic professor always did. He's like, he says, everybody believes really? their language is beautiful, and they're all correct except for the Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> Man. That's awesome. Yeah, I. Oh my gosh, I I love Dutch. I would never be able to speak it well. I don't think just because my pronunciation of the vowels, I butcher everything. But I, yeah, I do love it. Vowels are very hard. Vowels are very yeah. hard in Dutch. Yeah, they're they they're are. like English levels of hard. And also, it's very. There's a lot of cognitive cognitive dissonance if you've studied German. Yeah. And then you go to Dutch because you're expecting a lot of things to be pronounced a certain way, and it's like, no, nah, it's actually just pronounced how it's spelled. It's like, I'm really supposed to pronounce this Z as a Z, and this V is a V, and this isn't a SH? I mean, it's a, oh, that mm. airport. In, in, in German, it would be, you know, Schiphol, or Schiphol, actually, probably. Mm. But in, in Dutch, it's Schiphol. Schiphol. I mean, why not? Oh. Uh, but, um, <laughs> no, there's, I, I, for me, at least, um, I don't have any language in particular that I, I don't like. I think that um, some languages, the features that they have make it more difficult for me to try to, to learn and study. Um, but, you know, that's a difficulty thing um, and not like a I don't like it thing. Um, I don't know. I think a lot of people, when they say they don't like a language, it's because they were forced to learn it at some point and they didn't want to. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like that's a bigger cognitive thing or they associate it with a something in their life that is not pleasant. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Because otherwise, like the languages themselves are, you know, especially when we're talking about natural languages are just super cool when you really look at them. Yeah. Um, well, and that's something wild. It's, it's amazing. Um, there are, of course, conlangs that are not as well developed as others. Mm -hmm. um, but like I then don't I don't know, like I guess I just don't if if I don't like it, I just don't read about it. I don't know. I And so it's um, I couldn't think of one off the top of my head um, to even talk about just because it's you know there's all different stages of development for conlangs that's the best way to look at it uh the you know they're on the path yes you know? they're getting there and yeah. when they return to it because you know another thing about conlanging is it's always like you you start a language you work on it but it may be like eight months later when you finally you know return to it and start doing something else and then you put it away for 20 years and then you come back to it so you know it's like <laughs> kind of like have a break in between like creating the language and when you have to like pick it back up again to like work on it what was that like that, for you guys to like do that that is really hard um and that was you know something I learned like I said this is the the first time I'd worked on um or David had mentioned the first time I'd worked on any project really um it was very difficult because it's like you think you're going to remember everything when you're in the work zone, right? Like you're like, oh, yeah, don't worry about writing that down. We're totally going to remember that this verb does this, whatever. Um, and then a year later, you know, you get more translations and you have to return to what you had in the language and you're kind of scratching your head going, wait, did we never write down what the pronouns do? Did we never actually document this? Mm -hmm. um, but especially with our quick turaround time for this one, we just, for some of it, didn't have time to document it. It was just yeah, like, you got to go. That's the worst part. And so we spent the start of our work on season two just reviewing all the translations we had done for season one and going, oh, okay, this is how it worked, and actually trying to, to document some of those examples so that way we could you know, do the work, make it consistent. Um, and we did, but it is a process. Like every time we keep um, really not as thorough as they should be, but thorough language documents um, for every language we create. And that's, you know, the first thing you have to do is go back to the document and sort of reteach yourself. 
what kind of vocab did we have? What, you know, what did they do? How did the, the sentences work? And you got to have a little refresher. There's a lot of bookkeeping involved or that should be involved uh, that allows you to be able to you know, actually work with the language and, and use it for translation. Uh, and if you don't keep that up, things can be very difficult um, and you run into problems. I mean, that's, that's actually been one of my big problems with the, uh, with the both Astapori and Miranese Valerian, which were derived from Valerian. I had to do it pretty quickly, and I never wrote down fully exactly what the sound changes were from one to the other. Um, and when I did, I realized that some of them worked that way and some of them didn't, which isn't necessarily an enormous problem. There can be irregularities, but it would be the type of thing where it's like, I remembered the ordering being one way, and I did it the opposite way, and it's like, oh, man, I can't do that. So, so yeah, like... <sighs> What we what we really need is we need um, we need YouTube to be sentient, and then what we can do is we can, as we're working, you know, we just record everything, and then it goes and it just takes down like all the notes and That'd everything be great. and fills it in. You know, we need need more AI built into yeah. to all that process. I mean, so you know, we have a joint uh, we have a YouTube channel called Langtime Studio, where we create a language live um, for, for two hours every Thursday. And that's the only time we work on it. And there's a lot of lost time mm -hmm. to us sitting there thinking like, okay, what did we, what were we doing last time? Yeah. And then, or like we come to a thing and it's like, wait a minute, I remember we talked about this. It was like seven episodes ago. And we just desperately ask our viewers, do you remember what we said? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they do. Oh my gosh. Yeah, they're usually really good. You guys are it. like yeah. You guys are like spies cuz that was our next question was about oh. your YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's so cool. Well, it was that like means you know about it. Can nice. you explain your content and and why you decided to start it? So you kind of already explained the content, but Yeah. Why did so, you guys uh, decide to start your YouTube channel? Well, really, it was because um, it was the off time with Motherland Fort Salem. And, and, you know, I was working with a couple of different people on a couple of different projects. And I realized I just wanted to be working with Jesse again. And I just thought, well, this could be an excuse. Let's just do this. Uh, you know, especially because we had so much fun um, recording our, our work sessions for Motherland. Uh, we should do that again, by the way. We really I, should. I, I've yeah. been forgetting about that. Like, yeah. We should do that. I mean, it's kind of too late, but <laughs> or for motherland, but for other stuff. Um, but um, so uh, so I I had uh, and have had for quite some time a a passion project to uh, create a board game that's kind of like a board game version of a video game that I was a really big fan of. Uh, called Shining Force, um, and Shining Force 2, the same system, uh, which for for younger people is like the birth of Fire Emblem. But I don't know, I tried Fire Emblem, I didn't like it as much. Um, and and so I wanted to do a board game version of that, and I, and I actually got the rules set up and figured out what the theme was going to be. It was going to have, you know, it was going to be, you know, uh, kingdoms of animals battling each other, you know, um, but like, you know, cuter, um, I mean, on the, on the cute side, right? And something that was holding me up was I wanted all of these animal kingdoms to have their own languages. Um, and initially I thought like, well, I'll just take some of my old languages and brush them up. And I started to do that with one of my languages, with Gieler, but they're just not, they were just not good enough. Um, and it was going to take too much work. Uh, to get them to a place where I was happy with them. And I just wanted to do too many things differently. Like, uh, like just the, the writing systems, I wasn't happy with them anymore. Like I wasn't, you know, it just wasn't working. And so that meant creating a whole bunch of new languages. And so I thought, well, that's perfect. You know, I want to do something with Jesse. If she's interested, then maybe we can just create them together. Um, but also live stream because that's something that we do really well. And, and also like, 
we could start a Patreon, and so then it kind of justifies, you know, its existence. Um, and uh, and really, that was where it started. And uh, and so yeah, we've done we've done three of the languages for the uh, for the we started with the rabbits, and then moved to the opossums, and then the mice. And so they're they're done, or you know, done. Right. Uh, and and right now we're working on the cat language, which is going very well. And, uh, and next season will be the dogs, and that'll be the original five. And then after that, we'll talk about expansions. Have some fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I will say the timing of it just ended up working out <laughs> the way it did. Um, because, you know, we had been in in plans, getting things ready for, I guess, like a couple months, um, just, you know, back and forth, everything from what is the name going to be, um, you know, what designs, et cetera. So we have been doing that, uh, to get ready for it. And we decided to do our first episode in late February, it's February 27th of mm -hmm. 2020. And so, um, at the time, our, one of our biggest concerns was that David traveled so much, um, you know, giving talks and things like that, that we were going to have to figure out, you know, like a consistent enough time to be able to do this live stream. So people would kind of know when and where to find us. Um, and so we were really worried about that because we were like, well, let's just start and we'll deal with your travel schedule as we get there. He had all these trips lined up and then, um, you know, we did our first episode and two weeks later we were all in lockdown. And so it suddenly became something much bigger, I think, not just for us, but you know, our, some of our viewers, longtime viewers had said the same, that it sort of became like a a thing that, you know, you could return to on Thursdays. Um, and that was a, a nice way to interact with people when we were all yeah. <laughs> kind of stuck. Yeah, absolutely. Jeez. I what a time that, that was. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. I mean, but, you, but you guys like made something beautiful out of that situation. So yes, thank that's you. What yes, that's yeah. Mm -hmm. So I love it. This, to move out of the YouTube channel for for like a second. Uh, so in terms mm -hmm. of like languages that you you've created or you guys have been involved with, our audience is probably most familiar with Menashe, obviously Motherland, and mm -hmm. then probably Trig from the One Hundred. Yeah. So for uh, David, since you've worked on both of these, I'm wondering how do you uh, differentiate between languages to make them unique in their own entity when you're like creating multiple languages. Oh, I mean, well, in the case of tree get a slang, I mean, you, you couldn't be talking about two things that are, are, are more wildly different because, mm -hmm. uh, in, in language creation, uh, a couple of the basic terms we have are whether a language is a priori or a posteriori. Now, a priori means that you create all of the words in grammar whole cloth, um, because they're not based on anything. So that's the, that's the case with Minishe. Everything is uh, brand new and original. In the case of Trigeta Sang, of course, that was, uh, that was English um, in the distant future, you know, a hundred years after the, the, the nukes um, in the show, uh, after societal collapse, and then plus um, a couple of uh, sci-fi factors that, you know, uh, kind of like, uh, I guess, served as a catalyst I think, and so every single word, every single word of Trigger Design comes from modern English, uh, and and really, it's like I always say that uh, Trigger Design is the easiest language for an English speaker to learn that is technically not English. <laughs> um, and so, like you know, like it, there wasn't a case where it was like, you know, oh, what what should the word for you know. I don't know, tree, what should that sound like? Or what should the word for chair sound like? Instead, it was, okay, what should the lexical source for this be? Should it just be carried over straight so it didn't change from English? Uh, should it be something where just like a new coinage came up to, to take the place of it? Or uh, should it be the case that this is one of the uh, code words that the, um, oh my God, I've forgotten the name of the doomsday cult, what's it called? You help me out. <laughs> oh. The, the, um, the, um, wait, Doomsday. The no, Mountain no, not Men the people? No, not no, the no, Mountain no, Men. No, no, from, no, no. from the last season of the show. Second, Second Dawn. Dawn. Second Dawn. Oh. I, 
Yeah, the second dawn. So, or is it going to be a part I of forgot. the the code that you know uh, Becca Pramhada came up with? Because that was why there were a lot of words that switched meaning so radically is because she invented a code to be able to determine, you know, in group versus out group. Uh, so it's, so there are some, there's a lot of natural evolution in tree get a slang, but there's also some where it's just like the word for, um, uh, mother, father, sister, brother came from number one, number two, number three, and number four. Um, and then they shortened up. Um, and that was just because it was code. It wasn't because like, oh, they you know, naturally stopped using the word for mother. No, it just came from that original code that, that Becca Pram had to came up with. Um, so like in this case, it's like, now nah, there's no worry about making <laughs> those languages sound different. They were going to be different no matter what. Now, if you're talking about like creating something brand new, whole cloth, a priori, how to make that sound different. Uh, there are two things. First, there are the sounds that you include, but that's actually not the biggest one. There are a lot of languages on Earth that have very similar sounds, very similar vowel systems, very similar consonants, that they're not super different. Uh, so the way that you make them sound different is with the rest of it, which is phonotactics. And phonotactics is tone or intonation, uh, and it's also how the syllables fit together you know, whether vowels can come next to each other, which consonants can be at the beginning or end of a word or in between. Um, and, uh, and then also um, kind of like what the intonational phrasing of things is. Uh, in this case, for many shay, of course, is a tone language. So the tone really carried that mm -hmm. and made it sound very different. Uh, and then for, for the rest of it, it was kind of like, it has the ejective consonants, which makes it sound very different. So uh, it has, you know, da versus ta. Um, and then uh, we can have some coda consonants, yeah? Yeah, um, yeah we absolutely yeah. can. There's one yeah. right there. Uh, <laughs> and there's two right there. Yeah, we can have yeah. R. Um, and, and so, I don't know, like, the, the result is unique. I mean, it doesn't sound like anything else to me. No. Yeah. Um, it's actually, like, like I can totally um appreciate the the fear that some conlingers have where they're like oh it's just going to end up sounding like this other thing but um it really is amazing how if you're you know even if when we work on multiple projects at the same time just by having like david had said the phonotactics there it's like and also the words that they need are often quite different and so the vocabulary and the way that you're working with them is so different that um you know, I'm just thinking of like our recent projects and it's like, if you line those languages up side by side, it's, there's, I don't think like a fingerprint that says, oh, David must've worked on this or, oh, Jesse must've worked on this. It's like, it's just not, yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't see that as. Man. Yeah. Just compare like, you know, many shades you get to Pahla to the one for the the movie that we're not supposed to talk about <laughs> <laughs> or to what you, you know, hear in paper girls. Um, yeah, it's, that's a fun one. It's God. all, yeah, that was so much fun to work on that. That's a disappointment. Like, you know, you never know, maybe season two will come and suddenly they'll be like, Oh, we're going to do stuff with you now. But like that could have been tree get a slang too. I hope so. Like it's yeah, it uh, really could have. Um, that was, it was a lot of fun though. Um, and uh, one of the things that, I enjoyed most about the features of Maniche um, was that it was a language with a sort of intense noun class system. Um, and so like you come up with a root in the, in the language and then by adding these different class markers, you can actually change the meaning. So it's like you get these relationships between words where it's like you're just kind of changing um, some sounds. Uh, up front, these like kind of regular prefixes. And because they're witches, we had decided to to go with the um, their use of the elements, you know, since there's the wind and everything. Mm -hmm. um, and so the six classes that we ended up coming up with were a magic class and then a human class, because, you know, we felt they would distinguish between, uh, you know, witches versus uh, all those humans, uh, and then the four elements. Um, and so by taking a base like, um, you know, to sing or to chant is Eda, 
And so you take that base and you like make it um, a water noun um, and that's a chant. But if you make it, um, or sorry, that means a song. Oh, this no. is a really bad example to no, use. No, that, that's a really water noun. Like, chant is water. And then that's air. Air. Yeah. You air is song. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I was looking at the wrong, the wrong thing. Um, but you can actually like sort of, as you look at the vocabulary, because I know it's on David's website, you can see how some of them are related that way. Yeah. Um, I was trying to find a really good example where, oh, this one's That's fun. That's cool. This one's really fun, where you take a human noun that uh, when you mark it with the human class marker, it means traveler or nomad. Uh, but if you make it an earth noun, it means fog or mist, because it's that idea of kind of moving a, you know, around a lot. Moving. If you make it a fire yeah. noun, smoke, um, but it's core, like when it's just used without any class markers, it just means cloud. Yeah, so the, so the word class. for traveler literally comes from a root meaning cloud. That's so it's cool. Really cool. I love that. Oh, yeah, yeah, the, this language, yeah, the critical yeah, this decision making points is fascinating. Yeah. So how did you guys come up with creating the, the difference in the dialects just because of the, the witches and, and humans to. Do you mean like, um, well, of course you, so this, this is oddly enough happened to me twice. Uh, where the very last episode of season one, the very last line, they say, we want a different version of this language for some reason. So the very last episode of season one, they wanted the Camarilla to speak their own version of Miniche, but then they quickly abandoned that in season two. <laughs> it, was, that? it was not necessarily their own version. It was basically like saying um, they're kind of language learners who didn't get it, and so we... Like they wanted, I That's think my retcon for it. <laughs> they, um, but yeah, they did. If you, if you listen to how they use it, they use words differently and the pronunciations differ, um, for how the Camarilla speak it. And so, yeah, they did want something special for the Camarilla, but that did get dropped. And then this season they wanted an older form of the language that ended up only showing up, I think once the entire three season. times, three times. Oh, okay. Three times. Um, even though they had, you know, they wanted it. And so it's like, well, yeah, sure. We've got it. We can do this. Um, and, but it, yeah. So that's didn't really show up. That's, that's where you hear, uh, that's what you hear when, um, it, I'm pretty sure it's the first episode, right? Where, uh, you go back in time and you see the original. Mm -hmm. witches. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's also yeah. what May's mother uses when she says burn the collars, which I'm still not. 100%. Mays, you mean Sally's? No, her, her name is May. Yeah. Yeah, yeah May. Oh, you said May's mother. Tally's mother, May. Tally's mother, May. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. Did, did I say May's mother? <laughs> yeah, but it's oh, okay. Sorry. Um, and it's okay. Uh, so she uses it. And um, then it's used one more time. I have to look it up. Yeah, we'll have to look it up. I don't remember. Um, but yeah, that's that um anyway there's a uh, nice thing i wondered they, about may yeah there's there's many shades still coming in next two episodes so that's good yeah yeah but it's um for the older yeah. form of the language that um that that's part of what we do when we create language anyway is we start with um you know what would have been you know, the older form, and then we put sound changes to it. So that way you get some of those sort of irregularities that pop up in natural languages where it's like, you know, an F is usually pronounced as an F, except when it comes after this sound and then it, it kind of shifts. And so by, by actually creating the older roots, you can get these sort of sound changes and little things that happen. Um, like that example for cloud, it's fiade is the base, but if you put the, um, the earth, earth marker yeah. in front of it, it actually comes out, the bass comes out pronounced as piade because the, you know, there used to be a nasal sound there. So it sort of affects it in ways that if you know the history and the way that, that things progressed, it makes sense. But on the surface, you're looking at it and, you know, modern speakers wouldn't even necessarily know the two are, you know, really related. They may not even connect it because it's like, oh, it's piade and, and tapiade, which, you know, they may not 
fully put together in their minds in the same way that English speakers get blown away by the fact that like, whoa, these two words come from the same source um, and you never would have known it without doing etymological research. Um, but anyway, that's part of our process. So when they wanted the yeah. older language, it's like, well, yeah, we've got these roots. We can put them together in ways that make sense for where the, the language developed from there. Um, and so that was that was a fun process, though, to be able to work with the old bits that normally just show up in our, our dictionary. I'm trying to think of an English example. You can never think of one off the Well, like I that. mean, like there's some that are super <laughs> off the wall that nobody would guess, like apothecary and bodega and boutique are all from the same source. Yeah. And so like that's like that's, bizarre. Yeah, it's, it's um, a good one. But another one is um, even a simple one like breakfast where people are like, that's a compound word for, you know, you break your fast with the, the meals. And so like some people are like, I had no idea those were related because oh, we and, say it differently and we don't treat it the same way. And arugula and its British pronunciation, rocket, came from the same word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so crazy. It's so weird. But yeah. So it seems like once you guys kind of create, at least start working on the language and kind of create it, it definitely like can just evolve in so many different directions, like as the show kind of goes on, depending on what they needed. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So that's fascinating that you got to do like the, the OG language and then like thousands of years later, like there's so many decision points you guys have to take into account. It's fascinating. Yeah. It's a lot of fun though. Yes, it is. It sounds like fun. <laughs> how much, um, how much of the language do the actors actually get to, to learn and, and who would teach them that? Well, they, they learn their lines. Yeah. And that's usually it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Makes sense. They, they Makes sense. A couple yeah. of them probably know by now. <laughs> yeah. Let's begin. Yeah. Um, but, uh, <laughs> it, it, it depends on the actor. Some of them are, are really curious about it. Some, some are, are, you know, just like, well, I'll just learn the line and, and do it really well. Um, every, every so often, once in a blue moon, you find one that's like antagonistic towards it, but that's rare in my experience. That's mm -hmm. nice that it's rare. Um, but, uh, then there was, uh. Uh, dialect coach, which I'm pleased we actually got to work with several times to make sure that, you know, his pronunciation was, was good before he was working with the actors. That was nice. Um, and, and yeah, he's a good guy. He's up there in Vancouver. Yeah. And he actually, um, at least by season two, um, I don't, cause I, I didn't really start working with him until season two. Um, but like every time lines were sent out, he'd schedule, you know, like a zoom meeting and we would go over and he would, you know, say, here's how I think I heard it in the recording and here's how I, I have it. Is this correct? And so we'd be able to go back and forth. Oh. Um, and so that was cool. Spotted an, an error once. Like I, I think mm -hmm. I had recorded it correctly, but we didn't write it. Mm -hmm. And I was like. And then that sent us back, like, why was there a glottal stop there? Yes. It's stupid glottal stop, because then it's like, was it an accident? Because a glottal stop is just It ended up thing. not like, being an no, accident. No, it wasn't. A uh, glottal stop is a thing that, like, in between uh-oh and, you know, like, in the, in the, like, you know, in Hawaiian, anytime you see something being with H-O-O, -O, it's, you know, ho-o. -oh. So, you know, ho-oponopono or something like that. Um, and so we have glottal stops functional in this mm -hmm. language and they can be at the beginning of a word where they're very difficult to hear. Mm -hmm. Uh, like Hawaiian does that, you know, uh, there's, you know, O versus O and those are two different words in Hawaiian. Um, and in fact, so is, um, A-U is another word and then A-U also a different word and then, you know, O and then O, those are all different words. Um. And you know why? It's because originally uh, what the what was K in the older form of Hawaiian became a glottal stop, and that's why it's so ubiquitous. Yeah. But um, in this case, it was like, why on earth is there a glottal stop at the beginning of this word? Was it an accident? Because it's English speakers, we do it just by nature, mm -hmm. and so it could have just been an accident. But it turned out that it wasn't, and we just kind of forgot how that 
worked. And so then we went and fixed it. <laughs> um, but he was also, I know when he um, had worked with the actors, um, one of the things that he also did with us during the Zoom meetings was to make sure he understood um, how the sentence structure broke down in the translation. So that way you get more natural, like, you know, pauses in the middle of a sentence or like, mm -hmm. if I need to take a breath, does it make right. more sense to take the breath between these two spaces or this other one? So he would make sure he understood the, the full flow of the translation um, to be able to work with the actors on that. And he would also ask a lot of questions in terms of like, okay, like if the, if the actor wants to do this in an angry way, or maybe this line is going to be sad. Like, would mm -hmm. this be acceptable? Is this intonation getting in the way of tone? And, you know, like, so he asked a lot of really cool yeah. variation questions uh, to work with us. And then I know that he mentioned as he worked with the um, actors, he would actually, um, I, I forget all the different things he did. Cause he had like singing exercises in terms of getting, especially for the tone, um, to make sure they could hit the tones uh, well. Um, he had like singing kind of things and he would also work with them to be like, well, what was the English that you just said to make sure they were always aware of like what they were actually saying instead of just memorizing this chunk of sounds and not really understanding as an actor what they're saying. Um, and so he would quiz them and do things. So like, yeah, he was a, a really cool, cool person to, to work with. Yeah. You don't always get that. Mm hmm. In, in situations where there isn't a dialect coach, um, do, do you guys work with the actors or how is the, I guess, the pronunciation kind of communicated to them without the dialect coach? I damn well should, but uh, I've, I've served as a dialect <laughs> coach, uh, like the actual dialect coach once, and that was on Bright, and I was really pleased with everybody's performance on that. Um, the rest of the time, like, I mean, it, it doesn't matter what the whether there is or not, I always uh, record everything on MP3. Um, and, uh, and we're working on getting Jesse to record as well. I did some this season. You did, didn't you? That's right. Yes. Right on. Um, and so um, they can just listen to the MP3 and repeat it verbatim. Um, and if they do that, they'll do it well. Um, and I can tell when there are actors who've done that because, like, they have... Uh, because like I, I know the the specific kind of like way I did it, and so I can tell if they were just copying that, and that's that's fine. Uh, uh, sometimes that's more successful. Sometimes it's less successful. Hmm. Um, the most successful thing to, would be to have the people who create the language work with the actors um, beforehand and during. Um, but you know. That, that's that's rare, unfortunately. Um, but you know, at least they can have like you know, literally their lines just on their phone that they can listen to in between takes. Um, and that's really the next best thing. Indeed. Yeah. So uh, for Motherland, of all, of the actors, in your opinion, like who who excelled at the Menage? Rail's good. Rail is good. I think, um, I, I, I mean, I, I thought everybody did a really good job. Um, but the one that I think blew me away, especially the first time, um, and oh my gosh, I'm totally blanking on her name now. Adil's little sister. Khalida. Thank you. Kylie. Kylie. Uh, yes, Kalita. Thank you. She's Kalita. Crazy yes. Good. Um, the first time I heard her speak it in season one, I was just Lord, because I mean, especially in season one, she was just so young. Um, yeah, but she seemed to really, really take to it. And so um, that just, like I said, just really floored me uh, the first time I heard her speak it. Yeah, she's cool. Mm. Wish her more. Yeah, I like, love that scene where she's teaching the Dodger kids to say, or uh, she's teaching the Dodger kids about the first song and, and mother tongue. That was a cool <laughs> scene. Yeah. And this um, this season, it was really exciting because they actually incorporated the language name. And so it was the first time you actually heard Meniche yeah. as a term rather than just yeah. calling it mother tongue mm. on, on screen. Yeah. And so that was really exciting for us. Yeah, it actually happens a lot that basically there's just a pet name for the language and it just gets used everywhere mm -hmm. rather than the language name we come up with. So it's like they always call... Um, 
uh, handling of the Witcher's language, it's always elder tongue or elder speech or elder. Um, if it's if it's yeah. spoken by elves, mm-hmm. it's going to be elvish no matter what you call elvish. it. And, <laughs> and, uh, it's so true. <laughs> it's so true. Yeah. Uh, so it's cool that yeah. like this season, nice. um, uh, Elliot made a point specifically of incorporating the name of the language. Uh, at, well, twice is far as I know and then but then like one actually saying you know presenting it in that way that was just really cool yeah to be able to say hey that this is the ask me a nap I sure can this is you know the language name oh there, there is a book situation. yeah because before they did it this season like Elliot mentioned it in those like he does like uh, those little after the storm interviews where he talked about ministry right right but like to hear it in the show is like oh Cool. Yes. Yeah, that was, really fun. That was really cool. Was to have cool. A, I, I feel like so seamlessly presented the way that it was. Um, it felt really natural. It wasn't, yeah. I don't know. You, you could imagine where it would be kind of awkwardly pointed out or something, but um, right. I was, that was really cool that you did that. Yeah, Elliot. Elliot is, a, it's a very Elliot thing to do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> He loves details. Yes, yes. <laughs> details are good. <laughs> uh, so does Minishare have an influence on the seeds that the witches sing at all, or is it a separate entity at period? Those are actually kind of separate because it's um, about just hitting a certain tone, right, with their with their special vocal cords. Um, and so the seeds are, um, distinct from language to the point where I believe the, the envisioning of them is that they're older than any language Mm -hmm. where it's Mm -hmm. like, it's just these sounds that, um, you know, when put together do this very special thing, um, you know, before there was even language to communicate. And so that is, I believe the, the creative, um, envisioning behind it. And so, yeah, the seeds are separate um, in terms of how they're treated. However, them having seeds and having, you know, that vocal apparatus um, did inspire some words that we created in the language and, you know, gave us new ways to think about things. But they are separate in terms of, you know, phenomena. Yeah. It's also nice so that the one they use the most, it's basically uh, an alveolar aggregate adjective. Yeah. (sighs) Oh, the, 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 mm-hmm. oh, the wind strike. The wind strike. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. The wind strike would be a better thing to call it than the blowy thing, but yeah. <laughs> hey, they both work. Hey. Right. By the way, that language, that's basically German. Once you start looking at the, how the words are actually built, it's like, you know, blowy thing would be the equivalent of, uh, you know, that's why I love German so much. Yeah. It's too much fun. <laughs> Um, question though. So when you guys were like working on motherland and creating Menashe and building your dictionary and all that stuff, did you ever think you'd have to come up with words for like mothball, old sea hag, or like disease oh, genitalia man. that showed up in the show? <laughs> no, we did not. Just um, curious. And I think that that line when we first got it, the old sea hag line, um, you know, we're just kind of staring at it like well, you know, mother tongue is so old and it would have treated these, you know, concepts and terms a little bit differently. And so coming up with with ways to, to treat it in the language were a lot of fun. Um, and the disease genitalia, that one, um, I mean, made us laugh, but it's at least concepts that it's like, okay, these would, you know, be pretty similar yeah. um, right. in language. Uh, because they would have similar in this, in the sense that they would have words for diseased or, you know, something like that. Um, rather than saying like, you can call someone a, you know, a sea hag, that's, that's something that is kind of English based. And so you had to think through like, what would their insult be? Right. Um, but for the diseased genitalia line that came out this season, um, one of the things that we kind of had fun with was like, well, this is you know, the witch's language. And so um, one thing that we tried to really incorporate throughout some of the vocabulary creation was a focus on the matriarchy 
Um, and so the base term being, you know, sister being the like, if you're going to say something, sister is going to be more likely. Um, and so having then, you know, you have to use a compound or something to get to other forms of it. And so for genitalia, it's like, well, the base form would, would be female genitalia. So we ended up having to come up with, um, because it was said to a man, we actually, I'm going to look that up. What did we end up coming up with? I remember having a whole discussion about it. Yeah. So um, that's basic. Female genitalia is just basic. And then we had to, we did a compound with, what is this word? Eel, yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's right. That's what we did. Okay, so to to be able to do the insult because it was said to a man, um, he can't. You can't just use the basic word, which is specific to female genitalia. Um, you had to uh, use the compound form, which means um, essentially to hang or to droop with genitalia. Yeah. Uh, and so, <laughs> That is your droopy genitalia, which in and of itself is like, yes, yeah, it's I love it. <laughs> it's diseased and droopy. Uh, diseased uh, and droopy. That's just like droopy is such a word. I just love it. <laughs> I just love that pathway you have to go through just yeah, to have that me insult. Too. That's amazing. It's amazing. Thank you, guys. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Oh, that's so much fun. Yes. <laughs> and just, uh, just so, so that you know, kind of makes base... me wonder. Uh-huh. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, okay. I was going to say, well, the base that means genitalia, um, I think it was actually David's idea. We made it also a water noun. And when you use that, it means sea anemone because of it, how it looks. Yeah, so, that is cool. Clever. Yes, so, so what, a fun what little uh, tidbit like, in the language. <laughs> see, I'm gonna. Caitlin, note that down. Yeah, it's gonna use that. When you're coming up with a language, like what words you end up coming up with. This language is a word for sea anemone. It has a word for matriculate. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> But we don't have a way to say there I'm sorry. There you go. Yeah, no, none of that. <laughs> no one apologized. No. <laughs> it just made sense at the time when we created it. We don't apologize. We just own but it. But see it out of me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so have you guys, like, ever come up with words in a language just, like, to just make yourself laugh? Like, um... Like in the video where you guys were working on the season one finale, you have the word, was it ga as to die? Mm -hmm. Because yes, just your explanation yes. was like hilarious. Ga. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we definitely do that. We incorporate things that, you know, are, are funny. We incorporate things that, that we find meaningful. Um, and yeah, that's, I think, um, one of the the really really fun parts about language creation of course it's not you know we're not always going for the joke if we were then the language would sound pretty jokey on the surface but when you do Ooh. like these like a hit here or a hit there where it's like oh that's a good thing let's make this happen um it you know is something that sometimes on the surface nobody else would know about unless they really you know dug into our word choice or looked at our notes or asked or watched the videos or whatever um, but yeah, we definitely incorporate, um, like the God, which <laughs> totally made us laugh. Um, but I know another one that wasn't, um, you know, a, a laughing one. We also incorporate, um, words, um, in meaningful ways. Like if we want to put someone's name in the language or something and, you know, we make it sort of a meaningful connection that means something to us, but to other people. Um, so like, yeah, yeah, a lot of here names end up i was thinking of i don't remember what it means oh we used it for it to locate or to find in it it's oh for yeah the blood compass. for the blood compass and they never used the word did they they never they, used they did they did they yeah. did they, so they actually said uh, in season two okay they said blood compass because i but they didn't use it in season three when they no. could have yes. that was it yeah. that was it that was it so yeah, the, the word for blood compass in Maniche comes from a root uh, that's pronounced Anji, and that means to find or to locate, but that is important to me because that's my sister's name is Angie. 
And so Aww. it's, you know, that, so her, so cool. her name got to be in the episode. Um, and it was especially meaningful that he was using it to locate his sister. And so, you know, it was like mm-hmm. a really, really special connection there. Um, Dolly Parton's name got in here. Cause the root, yeah, the root. What? Oh, Where? Well, that's because I created it. Oh, um, oh so, yes. yes. Yeah. So Dali as a root means natural or innate, but you get um, words like forest and uh, charm and charisma that get built off of that root. And so that was my nice. little hack because I love Dolly Parton. Yeah. And Dolly That's Parton amazing. That, by the way. Yes, she would. Those tones right. <laughs> they, don't that's ask a, those questions that's just... right now. <laughs> are those tones right? That's where they are. Okay. Confidence, no shame in um, speaking. Yeah, we don't apologize here, remember? That's, that's right. right. That's yes. right. Right now. Right. Own those tones. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Own no, those tones. <laughs> yes. That should um, be your tagline. Yeah. For yes, real. it should be. Anything. Oh, Own the tones. Own those tones, man. <laughs> uh, you know, it's fun. Um, I, and I, I hope we get to do something like this, but it's really fun when you can actually sit down and create a language that is supposed to be jokey. So, like, I got to create a language for these little, these cute little Santa elves for uh, the Christmas Chronicles, which is just like a kid's movie. And that was a lot of fun. Uh-huh. Just sit down and it's like, well, what would be funny? You know, what sounds funny? And you just go with it. That's awesome. I hope that we get to do something like that. That's so cute. That'd be fun. <laughs> that would be a fun project. Well, I, I hope you guys get that project one day. <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. But we we have come to the end of the interview. And so before we kind of wrap things up, I just wanted to see if you guys had any final words that you'd like to say to our listeners today. Uh, sorry, you go ahead. I was like, let oh, me. Oh, you looking something up? Uh, you looking something up? Well, but... Yeah. I will. I will say it's been, you know, it's been so much fun working on on this show. I mean, it was transformative for us. Like that was, you know, really how we started working together. Um, and so, you know, it's a it's a bummer that it's going to end after se- three seasons. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, pretty definitive. Unless ending, but, we uh, save it. Yeah. <laughs> unless, well, yeah. Unless it, it's. I mean. If it, if it's going to be saved, it's probably another network, right? Um, or but, thinking or, streamer, or maybe a or maybe a prequel, maybe maybe you know uh, you know mm-hmm. Motherland, the mm-hmm. witch trials, like that would be cool. You know, the Salem witch trials. Ooh, yeah. That would be mm-hmm. cool. That would be cool. That would be so cool. Be cool, and just many shade be dropped right in there. That would be great. Um, or really, just like any point in the history, I like. Okay. Oh, by the way, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Twin Peaks, so I just couldn't believe it when this season, uh, when Michael Horse was on the show and gave him I right mean, an yeah. absolutely <laughs> iconic role. Yeah. So that was so amazing. good. I think it would be really cool to see um, a show that's set in the session. Um, you know, if not in exactly, the future, yes. but some point in time in the past. Mm, yeah. Uh, you see how it all got started. I think that would be awesome. I think that there is a lot of uh, potential in the world building there for other shows. So I hope so because um, it was a lot of fun working on this language. And um, and like mm-hmm. that, the other thing is like the the fandom is there. Yeah. I mean, I think maybe like the first season of Motherland Fort Salem didn't air during the during the pandemic. Yes. Right? Yeah, it did. Yeah, and so it was like, I don't think things really started picking up until it was like the lead up to season two, maybe a little right. later and people were watching it on Hulu. Like, the the fan base is there now, and and so it seems like kind of the wrong time to be ending the show, but it's like, you know, it's totally out of the hands of the people that are working on the show. Um, anyway, mm-hmm. so, yeah. if, if if we can continue working on it, believe me, we will. And then, all right, what'd you find? Well, you got it? I realized suddenly that I, I did the the wrong thing. Oh, okay. I was trying to say... You need to fill more space. Um, just a second. I, I will have... Okay, yeah. okay. So, 
que ella ravu no wait ravu i think it's slow tone ravu isn't it ravu oh i was doing plural ra oh ravu oh que ella ravu yeah there we go just what david said uh <laughs> as i'm like doing this with all my tones make sure i'm hitting he's like bum 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 um but that means we thank you all because that like part of you know we of course had fun uh working on the language just because we enjoy it um but it's so so cool to see the community take to it um and you know ask for translations and um what not and so yeah that means in mini shay that means we thank all of you <laughs> that's awesome <sighs> Thank you guys so much. And then I know we had hiccups scheduling this, but like, thank you so, so much for taking the time to talk to us and like share all of this with our audience. Like you guys did a phenomenal job with creating such a unique language for this crazy world that Elliot built. And just thank you so much for like enriching the story with your language. Yeah. Awesome. And, and thank you for your patience with us and getting this to happen. Yes. <laughs> no way. It was literally any time this was <laughs> right so on, much fun right i we learned a ton we appreciate it so thank Did you caitlin have cool. anything yeah caitlin ah oh, man <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is like a, a famous thing that happens to caitlin caitlin's camera doesn't like her <laughs> went off the air for the night right it did, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to figure it out. The auto sleep is off. No. Um, is there a way to say that Rayel needs therapy? <laughs> <laughs> yes. He needs to know. He does. Yeah. yeah, because we say it every episode and it would be even more fun to say it in Minishe. Oh, oh, can you can you uh, figure out a way to say hydrate for lesbian Jesus? <laughs> We call Rayo lesbian Jesus. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's an explanation, I promise. We'll, we'll figure something because out. Because of all we'll the... Know. We're not going to figure it out on the fly. We'll figure out something for you, and then we'll we'll send you some audio files. Please do. About that. Yes! <laughs> yes! <laughs> no please pressure. and thank you. No pressure, yeah. Yeah, right No on. pressure whatsoever. Um. <laughs> That, that's all I had for the podcast. <laughs> so I'm going to stop recording. Thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And with that, we've been Big Witch Energy. If you like this episode, check out all of our other episodes right here on YouTube. Please like, comment below, and subscribe for more amazing content. Hydrate for lesbian Jesus. 